America, we have a big problem with big money in politics. In 2020, over $14 billion was spent on elections, more than double the amount spent in 2016. And since 90% of those contributions came from just 300 wealthy donors, the voices of 330 million Americans were drowned out. The enormous financial influence wielded by special interests obstructs progress, leaving the survival of our democracy dependent on Americans to act now. American promise exists to empower, inspire, and organize Americans to pass a constitutional amendment to end unlimited money in our elections and return our government back to we the people. And it's already happening from Alaska to Maine and all points in between, from living rooms to boardrooms, from city halls to state houses. Americans are coming together to renew the promise of human liberty, equality, and a true representative government. Together, we can eliminate this special interest influence in our elections. Together, we can hold our elected officials accountable. Together, we can build a government of the American people for the American people. Are you ready to make history? Join the movement. Join the fight. Join American Promise. So good morning again, everyone, and welcome to this uh, very special day. Um, pleasure for me to be here to help out with the program a little bit. Um, I'm Tom Milburn. As a past president of the Rotary Club of Green Bay, it's a pleasure to join with American Promise to welcome you here today to seek changes in how the American election campaigns are financed. And you'll have a chance to be part of that discussion as we move through the next few minutes. We'll explain American Promise's mission and how that is to change by a constitutional amendment, the way election campaigns are financed, and how that blends with Rotary's embracing of a broad-based notion called positive peace. Um, existing campaign laws, yeah, they have uh, continued to exist. They have continued to allow a pay-for-play system. In these parts, we remember Feingold, McCain, back in 2002. Uh, Russ worked really hard on that. Uh, that amended the Election Campaign Act of 77. But the behind the scenes money from big time donors has continued to basically overwhelm the system. So today we'll learn more about this grassroots efforts to amend the Constitution, creating as of now what would be the 28th Amendment. We begin locally with uh, two leaders of Green Bay Rotary, our immediate past club president, Howard Hauser, but first our current club president, retired financial advisor for Wells Fargo Advisors. Please welcome Judy Nagel. Thank you, Tom, and welcome everyone. It's nice to see you all here this morning. I don't know if you're as disgusted as I am with the political ads of the last campaign. A lot of half-truths, no truth, character assassination. Someone once said to me, if airlines advertise the way politicians do, nobody would fly. The American public wants to vote on policy, not on who is the lesser of two schmucks. So this creates, this situation creates apathy and distrust of all elected officials. And that's why I'm involved. And I'd like to share with you why Rotarian values support this effort. Collectively, we have the power to change this. So I'd like to talk about it through the lens of positive peace, the optimum environment for human potential to flourish. Of course, Rotary has a long history of working on peace and conflict resolution. As you may know, Rotary formed a partnership in 2014 with the Institute for Economics and Peace which studies positive peace. Their research shows eight pillars that contribute to positive peace. These eight pillars predict lower future physical violence, greater societal well-being, and higher economic growth. 
Thanks to the efforts of groups like Rotary, positive peace has been growing around the world. In 2017, six champions were honored, and they were honored at the UN Day of Peace, including work done on the peace treaty in Colombia, and in 2018, Rotarians celebrated projects in Uganda and Mexico. But positive peace has actually declined in North America. Though we started relatively high, our overall positive peace score has deteriorated by 4.5% since 2005. Ranking the US as number 18 and Canada as number 11, both had deteriorations. So what do we do as Rotarians? The first question, is it the truth? Clearly, if voters do not know the truth of who is trying to influence them, we cannot have the free and open exchange of ideas on which a democracy depends. But with the Citizens United rule changes, certain groups no longer have to disclose their donors. This created a way for funders to influence campaigns without voters knowing who they are dealing with and what their interests are. This is the definition of dark money. And as you can see, the amounts have increased dramatically. And it's not traceable. Potentially, it can be from foreign sources, say when a corporate contributor is foreign owned. So you can have a situation where in state or federal races, there is an attack ad at the 11th hour, which states something untrue, but the candidate doesn't know who's behind it. How do they respond? How do they have an open and honest debate? This actually happened in Montana. They had rules in their state constitution that were overridden by Citizens United. For example, in Montana, several state legislative races were recently swamped by attack ads that were funded by outside money. The ads were patently untrue, but neither the candidates nor the voters knew who was attacking them, so there was no way to respond. And this was shown in the movie Dark Money. In response, State Senator Lou Jones said, there will never be truth in politics until we can follow the money. So we can say that the rules that have been adopted make it harder to know the truth. Now to share more with you is my fellow Rotarian from the opposite side of the aisle, Howard Hauser. And so then, uh, in continuing with the four-way test, uh, the next question we ask ourselves is, is it fair to all concerned? And if government is accountable to the people, then the more people that support a policy, the more likely that policy is to become ado adopted. Well, the research shows something uh, very different. On the, the, the bottom line, the percent of support from a, a group, and you'll see the horizontal line, it charts the average people. Average people, the more, the greater the, the, the support, the probability of adoption doesn't change. It still hangs around 30%. If you take a look at the, the economic elites, the greater the probability of uh, the great, sorry, the greater support, the greater probability. So who has the control? Where is it at? So does that sound like that's fair to all concerned? No, I think it, in my opinion, no. It, it, it focuses on a, a small group, those people, the economic elites and the special interests. They're the ones that control the narrative. They're the ones that are at the table when the, when the time comes. Um, and that's not surprising because 76% of political spending comes from one-tenth of 1% 1 of the people. Again, that's, a, that's an important number. 76% of the political spending comes from one-tenth of 1% 1 of our population. So contributions drive that seat at the table. 
those contributions, it, it, who gets access, what, what perspectives are included in the discussion, and then turn themselves into um, legislation at the end. And yeah, it's, that, that's really troubling, but even worse is when it, it becomes really tragic when things like the opioid epidemic, which was sponsored by, pushed by Big Pharma, because they were paying for access to the FDA um, and made that happen. So will it build our next question uh, in the four-way test? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And you have to ask, um, does our current system do that? Again, in my opinion, no, it does not do that. Um, let, again, we want to look at the research. Oh yeah, this research. Oh yeah, I love this one. Americans have been, have been growing, have been growing um, a sense that you know the benefits um, are for the big money interests. And again, we'll look at you know, look at the way the chart goes. So this chart runs from 2016, from 1964 to 2016. The, the the percent of Americans who believe that big money was for the um, the special interests went from 29% in 2016 to 76%. I'm sorry, in 64 to 76% in 2016. And in fact, this is not the most up-to-date, there's, there's more recent, in 2000, and recently, it, that's gone to 89%. Conversely, the, the, the people that think that, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, government is for the benefit of all the people went from 64% in 1964 down to 21% in 2016, and that's since dropped to 9%. That's a scary number to me. So obviously, there's a growing sense, a growing belief that government does not is not run for all of us. It's run for the very few. So, and it, it, that, to me, that leads to the question: Why is there so much divisiveness, or divisiveness, depending on what part of the country you're from, um, in this country today? And here's what I think: Big money interests, they are the ones that are actually promoting this divisiveness and at the same time they're purposely blaming others and encouraging polarization outrage um, civic disengagement and loss of civility they they want us to distrust each other they want each side to look at the other and say it's your fault that we can't get anything done and, and got this problem solved and while we're fighting among ourselves they're sitting back Fat, dumb, and happy. Well, not so dumb because they're pretty slick, um, and getting exactly what they want. They get more control, more power, more money. The final question in the four-way test will it be beneficial to all concerned. I think we've already demonstrated it's not beneficial to all concerned. The system as it stands today. A few at the top benefit, while the rest of us pay the price, and we are paying the price in so many ways every day. It's an arms race of big money where no one really wins except the big money. But there is some, there, there is some good news starting to creep in because there are, are a few people that are standing up and speaking out for the, for the common good and are identifying the root cause. This is from former Senator Al Simpson. Money's dominance over politics is the number one problem our nation faces. It, it's a growing crisis that prevents us from lacking anything else, from tackling anything else. And then John Kerry, the unending chase for money, I believe, threatens to steal our democracy itself. But it's not just from the political leaders. There's also business leaders that have the same issue and are also struggling um, and are frustrated with, with events because they are, find themselves in a position that they need to be endorsing and supporting policies that they don't really believe in. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, just in the, in the need to avoid uh, negative legislation and cancel culture. It's the pay to play scenario. Um, and, it, and if they don't, their competition will. It's detrimental to business, it's detrimental to our economy. It pushes companies to compete through government favors rather than doing what they're supposed to do, which is innovate, invest for the long term, create value for their customers. You might find it surprising, this information. Again, more research. Uh, many polls show that a vast majority of Americans agree, we all agree, 
um, that we need to set political limits on spending. And at 80, 80 plus percent, to me, that's a huge number. You know, then obviously, everybody's here today. You're part of that 80%, uh, or whichever group you're in. It doesn't matter. It's, it's huge. But there's a lot of Americans already working on this, on this issue, and we need, we need more. 22 states have already passed resolutions um, for, for an amendment. We're hoping that Wisconsin will be 23. There's 800 cities and towns across America in red, blue, and purple states that have passed resolutions limiting campaign spending and by big margins. And again, it wasn't squeakers, it was by big margins. You know, we're talking about 80, 90%. That's also true of Wisconsin where we have 160 cities um, and towns, including, including Green Bay, that have passed such, such um, proposals. This set suggests to me that we need to stop arguing among ourselves. We need to stop, stop thinking of red and blue, left and right. We need to come together, work together for the, to solve the root cause and get big money out of politics. It's also a pleasure for us to welcome to Green Bay our next speaker. He's been a leading attorney in public and private practice for more than three decades. That includes time as Assistant Attorney General for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He's now a national leader of the effort to create a distinction between corporations and individuals when it comes to campaign finance laws. He's also an author, notably a book titled, and the book is longer than the title, but not by much, Corporations Are Not People, Reclaiming Democracy from Big Money and Global Corporations. Please welcome the President of American Promise, Jeff Clements. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, a lot of reference to corporations. Um, some of my best friends are corporations, although they're not people. Uh, I represented some of the biggest corporations in the world as a uh, partner in a large Boston law firm. I know many of us, like um, myself, uh, are both involved in business and involved in um, investing and everything else. Um, so I want to just emphasize, this is not about anti-corporation, anti-anything. Um, this is about, as John Nussbaum and so many others said, um, all of us pro-America, <laughs> pro-people, you know, pro-future, uh, pro-four-way test, positive peace. So um, the scale of this is so big, it's hard to get our heads around it. You know, you hear $30 trillion in debt. That's a big problem, <laughs> right, for the national debt. You hear you know, trillion dollar stimulus plan. These numbers just get thrown out. But the impact of what's happened in the last 10 years, um, I want to just walk through because it is a bigger force than America has ever had to deal with in terms of sustained propaganda, which effectively is what, where the money goes. It's not about facts or truth or any, it's propaganda. And just in 10 years, $100 billion has come into the system since the Supreme Court struck down Senator Feingold and Senator McCain's bipartisan campaign reform act. That's what happened. It's not that that was a bad idea or didn't work. It's that it got struck down under, and I'm a lawyer, I practice law for 30 years. I've represented journalists. I've defended First Amendment rights for much of my career. They have a kooky theory that the First Amendment free speech right means unlimited money that it violates the First Amendment if you try to actually enact what almost every American believes, which we need reasonable limits on money. So everybody has free speech. You can't have free speech for one-tenth of one percent and call it free speech. But that's the theory that struck down the McCain-Feingold law, five to four, and not just one case, several cases. I emphasize that just because it goes to why do we need an amendment? Because the Supreme Court made a mistake. And we don't need to argue about you know, whether, you know, what they were thinking. I respect the Supreme Court deeply. I, those, those five who went that way as smart people, honorable people. And there are several court cases that kind of tangled them up in knots as they went down this road. We can rescue them. This would be the eighth, ninth time constitutional amendments corrected Supreme Court mistakes. So it's what we do as Americans. And, this is why we have to, 2020 is just exploding. I don't think we're capturing all the money in, this, in the data, and it comes right there, opensecrets.org, wonderful website that takes all the data they can get, nonpartisan, trusted source, um, 
but there's so much dark money and back channels that I think we're just, this is just the surface, but it's exploded. Um, here's the update <laughs> from Howard's slide. He said it got worse. It has. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, barely anybody any longer thinks the core promise, the core American promise that the government is of, for, and by the people. Nobody actually believes that anymore. Unfortunately, they're right that government is for, by, and of a few big interests. So we got to turn that around. We've got to bring those closer together. There'll always be cynics among us. We don't have to have pot, rosy scenario pie in the sky. Oh, government's perfect. We just got to have enough faith in it to stick with this project or we're going to lose it. And, and so our work will close that gap and the constitutional amendment is, is needed for it. Um, I'm, I'm going to just bring up a bit more. Democracy is really important. Our constitutional republic is really important. Um, we do this as citizens, answering a call to service. But guess what? It's good for business, too. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to compete, either in a national marketplace, in a global marketplace, and the rules keep getting changed by interests that have far more capital to spend on politicians and dirty campaigns to actually rewrite the rules and end your business model, you're in trouble. You know, if you want to invest in, in your business, but instead you have to give another, you know, thousands of dollars to the trade association who's trying to, you know, defend a needed, you know, provision in the federal law or state law, that's capital out the door, you know. If you would like to take a position that, no, we're in business, we're not political, we don't want to give contributions, you know, we have employees, shareholders, and, you know, from all sides, and we're not going to pick and choose. Well, guess what? The politicians are going to still be calling you and saying, hey, you know, Howard, you're... Your competitor is at the fundraiser. You must have missed it. I'm sure I'll see you at the next one, right, Howard? And you know, that's from many of our business folks are saying, "Look, we're not. It's not bribery. It's extortion. <laughs> you know, we're not. We don't want to do this. We get the call. We get the pressure. It's pay to play." So that's Matt Patsky, CEO of Trillium Asset Management in Boston, one of many, many business people around the country who've joined and are helped leading our American Promise Business Network. So this is our solution. Um, we will put an, an amendment into the U.S. Constitution. I can say more about it, um, and I will. But it takes two-thirds of Congress to vote on it. It then gets ratified in three-quarters of the states. That's the technical way it happens. The actual way it happens, and we've done 27 of these. It's not, we're not the first ones. Um, the actual way it happens is just like this. In all, all over the country, rooms or Americans find a place where we can talk about this because you sure can't do it in the partisan politics. That's why I, I think Tom and others have said this is, you know, the Rotary isn't a political organization and nor is American Promise, even though we will need two-thirds of vote in Congress and ratification in 38 state legislators. This is above and bigger than any politics and it doesn't happen because you just say the right thing to politicians. It happens because Americans find a place where we can talk together and move it forward. That's what American Promise is. That's how we work around the country. Why an amendment? Uh, I, the technical reason, because the Supreme Court basically has told us we have to, or, we, or we're just at the beginning of this uh, destructive system. Um, so we have to, but it's permanent. We can get this right for generations to come. Um, it's nonpartisan, has to be. That's the, the, the hard thing about an amendment is actually its virtue. It's a, it's a virtue, not a vice, that it's so hard uh, because it forces us to remember we're in this together and we gotta figure out how to work together to get it done. And so we do, and then that actually starts the fixing of the system already, even before the amendment, because we, we are a bridge for Americans to both come together and move forward. And it is not a one size fits all, the only solution. If we just have the amendment, then we can be all done. The amendment creates a constitutional foundation for much better policies. And we will have to, and our children will have to, and their children will have to enact laws, do all the work of a citizen to make sure we're solving problems and getting the, the laws right. But if we don't have a constitutional solution, foundation for that, we can't do it. And that's the system we're in now. So this sets the foundation right, and there'll be many other things that we can then start getting right. If you want to join this great cause, 
All you have to do to start is sign what we call the citizen pledge. Um, and the citizen pledge simply says um, that, that you stand behind this constitutional amendment. It gives us the um, numbers and the growth that we need. It gives us the connection because we will ask you to fill out a little bit of information, including what party we, you are. And that's so we can both be accountable to ourselves that we actually are cross-partisan and we can see and make sure we're getting enough of everybody. But it also helps show that, hey, Americans aren't actually buying all the propaganda that says, you know, we're in a new civil war and all these other irresponsible things we're told about, you know, the future of our country. So please sign the Citizen Pledge um, and... Uh, and, and then help us, just as so many people in this room have done, to introduce us to others and introduce yourself to others as now members of the American Promise Movement, because uh, that's how we're going to win.